to start and so good evening to all of you and thank you so much for joining us uh, once again for from our foreign correspondent this time we are going to go to uh, Addis Ababa that is the capital city of Ethiopia and not quite because I don't believe our guest is actually in Addis Ababa at the moment I think that he's safely ensconced somewhere in the United States of America but, but just by way of introduction coronavirus as you know has thrown up incredible acts of kindness, of compassion, of caring, etc., of a kind that one has not seen in the world, you know, for a very long time. Some people have actually been doing this kind of work, this kindness, this compassion for a very long time, long before coronavirus. And tonight, we're going to hear the story about one such person who has uh, an incredible story to share with us, uh, and a very brave and courageous one as well. He is Dr. Rick, Rick Hodes, is the director for the Joint Distribu Distribution Committees, that's the uh, JDC, that the American organization that, that um, does so much good work throughout the world. And he is the director of Ethiopia's Spine and Heart Project. So Rick, a very, very warm welcome to you and thank you so much for joining us. As a point of interest, where about are you at the moment? Right now I'm in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, in Eastern Tennessee in the United States. Oh, you're staying with a cousin because you are, you are- right. um... I escaped Africa because of coronavirus, uh, flew to New York, didn't want to stay in New York for obvious reasons. And I have a cousin here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I had an uncle whose name was Mendel Maskowitz. Uncle Mendy married a Tennessee Baptist girl who had a kosher conversion and they moved to Oak Ridge and they were scientists at Oak Ridge National Laboratories. So I grew up coming to Oak Ridge, Tennessee all the time. And my cousin, who's a bit older than me, still has the house. So I'm sheltering with my cousin and her husband at this moment. Well, it sounds like a fascinating story that could uh, take us on a complete detour for the rest of the evening. But uh, we're going to come back to our, our topic and I want to ask you, how a, a young man who grows up, a young Jewish boy who grows up in Long, Long Island, New York, and wants to become an internist, which I think is probably the same as a GP in this country, if I'm not mistaken, you'll have to correct me. Go to medical school in Rochester, New York, and then you do internal medicine at the famous University of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. So that's a very kind of standard uh, pathway for a Jewish boy growing up in Long Island, you become a nice doctor, look after your, your well-heeled patients. How do you land up spending 30 years running a clinic in Addis Ababa of all places? Just give us very briefly the story, Rick. Okay, so I grew up in a reformed Jewish family in Syosset, Long Island. My town was a third Jewish, a third Catholic, a third Protestant. Everybody got along fine. Um, I didn't grow up realizing Jews were a minority because everybody knew about Jews and, and, you know, many of my friends were Jewish and, you know, it was just a normal Long Island life. Um, when I was in junior high school, and I come from a family that doesn't travel much, um, except to visit their, visit their relatives and so on. But when I was in junior high school, I was doing a lot of reading and I was reading about doctors working in places like Asia and Africa, and I decided that's what I want to do with my life. So this is an unusual thing, you know, for a Jewish kid in Long Island and anyone in my family especially, uh, but that's what I wanted to do. So um, I went to Middlebury College in Vermont and I got a degree in geography. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I had not thought about medicine seriously at that point. Um, so I hitchhiked to Alaska and I lived in Alaska for several years. Then I decided I should become, a, the best thing I could do with my life is to become a doctor. I did pre-med at the University of Alaska, medical school at University of Rochester. And then I went down to Baltimore and trained in internal medicine. Um, but somehow I got this bug to do global health. And as a medical student, I spent a summer in Bangladesh. I spent a winter in South India. Um, and when I finished my internal medicine training, I decided I wanted to spend one year teaching in Africa. So I got um, a Fulbright Fellowship and I moved to Ethiopia for one year in 1985 to teach at Addis Ababa University uh, in the Faculty of Medicine. So I was teaching internal medicine, which I think you guys call that a specialist physician, um, infectious disease, cardiology, that stuff. And that's what I was doing 
all the time. I did that for two and a half years. And then I was promised, promised a job with the World Health Organization. So I left and I was headed to Burma to take this WHO job. But uh, there had been a revolution in Burma and the job evaporated. So I ended up back in Washington for a while and I worked in a practice. Um, along the way, I was becoming more interested in Judaism and wanting to learn more and I was reading on my own. When I was in Washington, I started studying with a rabbi and started going to Israel and studying at yeshiva. And then um, I was in Israel the summer of 1989, I guess. Um, and I was reading in the Jerusalem Post about the Ethiopian immigrants to Israel. So um, probably November of 1989, Israel and Ethiopia reestablished diplomatic relations, which had broken off after the 73 war. Uh, Ethiopian Jews heard about this and they started migrating to Addis Ababa hoping to get to Israel. So by the summer of 1990, there was about 25,000 Ethiopian Jews and they were stuck in Addis Ababa. So um, they had a lot of medical problems and this was big news that they were getting sick and some were dying. I was reading about this in the Jerusalem Post and I wrote a letter to JDC, my present employer, and I said, listen, I'm an American doctor, I'm Jewish. I just spent two and a half years teaching in Ethiopia. I know all the doctors in the country um, and I speak Amharic. Can I help you? So they said, yeah, maybe. So they hired me for six weeks and I went to Ethiopia to take a look at the medical situation of the Ethiopian Jews. After six weeks, they weren't sure what they were gonna do with me. So they said, stick around for another six and keep on working. After 12 weeks, they said, well, you're doing okay and um, the death rate is going down and you clearly know how to practice medicine so uh, we want you to keep on working for us so this six-week contract that i had uh in nine that started in 1990 is still going on <laughs> fantastic and i'm coming up on 30 years with jdc so i was the doctor for the first the pre-operation solomon um mifsa shlomo when on, in May 24th, 25th, 1991, 14,400 Ethiopian Jews were evacuated overnight to Israel. Um, and I was on one of the last planes and I went to Israel with them. And then my job in Israel was to identify the patients with TB. I had, identi I had diagnosed tuberculosis in 3.5% of the population. Goodness. Started them on modern TB treatment which has to be done uh, the way we were doing it is mostly twice a week for six months. So they needed to be restarted on their treatment so they wouldn't default because that's a disaster when TB patients default. So I went, to, I went to Israel and we restarted them on TB treatment. Then I went back because there was a group of people who missed the plane and we had a program for them. We had the local people in Addis and then there was a special place um, it's located between Lake Tana in Gondar and the Sudan border, and it's called Quara. And the Jews from Quara were so isolated, we couldn't get to them during the Civil War. Uh, and so when the war ended, we sent a delegation in, and we had a special program to evacuate about 3,500 Jews from Quara. These were so isolated, these people, they had never seen a white person before. So when they first saw me, they said, we didn't know whether you were a human being or not. Amazing. They said, they said your hair, this is not human hair. Uh -huh. This is cat hair. Or this is funny, goat funny, hair. funny you don't look Jewish. I know. <laughs> and they said that to me. They said, we've never seen a white Jew. And I said, well, a lot of people have never seen a black Jew. Um, on the other hand, these people, they kept Shabbat. They kept Kashrut. They kept Nida. I once, want, I once said to one of these women, have you ever eaten non-kosher meat? And she started shaking and she said, has it ever happened that a Jew ate non-kosher meat? Like, <laughs> like, it was an unbelievable thought. Yeah, their first temple Jews. Yeah, I yeah. said, well, you know, it happens. <laughs> yeah. So just, uh, just moving on a bit, Rick, um, just so you, you land up in remaining in, in Addis Ababa. Uh, just tell us a little bit about some of the, the conditions that you live in. Tell us for a moment just about the, the Jewish community, what life is like there. I mean, you're a Dati person. Um, I know that you run a big open home on Friday nights, etc. What sort of infrastructure is there with, uh, I mean, you've shipped off 
um, most of your Jews, you know, so who's, who's left? What do you do? So um, the numbers of Jews has always been a bit unclear. Uh, Israel is now 1.5% Ethiopian. So uh, there's Ethiopians everywhere. Um, we in Ethiopia are now dealing with the remnants of the community who were converted by a, Br a British guy named Henry Aaron Stern. And there's the remnants of that community still around. I myself have a Jewish house in Ethiopia. Um, and there's mezuzot, mezuzot everywhere. I have a kosher kitchen. Uh, the house, we actually don't eat meat. And it's a vegetarian house. I myself am vegetarian all the time, but the house is vegetarian so that if somebody is more strict than I am, they, they would feel comfortable eating there. Um, I have a very good Christian cook who lives in the house and she knows how to run a Jewish house and she knows how to clean for Pesach. Um, is there a synagogue? Are there services? Are there no, so we have, there's an ancient mitzvah? Jewish community for a couple of hundred years, uh, the Jews from Aden in South Yemen. Um, Aden used to have 10,000 Jews. Aden was historically the end of the telegraph line to London. So for all of East Africa and the Middle East. By the way, we're just highlighting a Jew from Ethiopia, from Aden via Ethiopia. This is Danny Cohen. Huh, really? So we have Kohenim from Aden in Ethiopia. Uh, their last name is Kanzen. Kanzen, correct. I know them. Yeah. I, I mean, we like, I, I can't tell you how well I know the Kanzen family and I've known them forever. I've been to their weddings, their bar mitzvahs, and I go for Shabbos sometimes. Yeah. Um, you know more the high and Kanzen Kanzen. Yeah, very well. Very well. I'm so sorry to interrupt your little conversation over here. But. <laughs> Daddy was born in Addis Ababa and he lived there until he was 13, 14. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so it's the okay. same synagogue. Where you I grew up. Synagogue. I was bar mitzvah in that synagogue. Yeah, upstairs. Upstairs, yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. Their way to heaven. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you. We'll let you. Rick, let's come back. Let's come back to um, the areas in which in which you're working, um, and we're going to explore uh, three of them. One, the big one, of course, is spinal. Then there's pedi pediatric uh, oncology uh, and heart valve disease. But just before we we start to talk about uh, about them in, in greater detail, and hopefully see some of the, um, the, the slides that you have to show us. Just describe to us um, what the profile of your, of your patients. I mean, there's, I know there's still enormous, enormous poverty of a kind which we in, in the West simply can't comprehend. Just sketch for us who some of these, these people are who are arriving day after day after day after day uh, at your clinic and begging for your for your help. Can you give us um, a, a sketch of them, please? Yeah, I, I get um, I get a cross section. So I get very. I mean, one percent of my patients have cars. You know, having a car is a big deal. Um, many of the some some of the people are barefoot. Some of the people are homeless. Some of the people arrive in Addis Ababa and they don't have a place to stay. Um, Many of them, maybe most of them, live in mud houses in the countryside. So a typical Ethiopian um, who is not middle class would live in a mud house with a tin roof. They may have a dirt floor. If they're a bit richer, they'll have a cement floor. Um, they may have electricity or they may not. Um, probably half the country has electricity. It might even be less than that. One third of the babies in Ethiopia are born, are delivered by a trained health professional, two thirds or not. Um, so, and I'm the only person in the country helping kids with spinal deformity. So let me give you guys a presentation with some slides and I will narrate it and let you, let you see what I just, do. Just before you do that, Rick. Okay. Tell us uh, how as an internalist uh, physician, you became involved as you became so involved with um, uh, with young people and adults with spinal problems. What's, that, what's the story behind that? Okay, well, the story is the first slide I'm going to show. So let me show you the slide okay. um, and tell you the story. So I was volunteering at Mother Teresa's mission. I was the senior doctor working with the nuns um, and anyone who walked in the door. And so 
I was treating the, the average, any, anyone who the nuns asked me to treat. Well, one day these two guys walked in the Rick, door. Rick, we're not seeing your slides. Okay. Okay. Yes, we're back to where, how you start to become, to become involved in spines. Right. So in 1999, I was seeing patients at Mother Teresa's mission and these two guys were admitted. Um, this is tuberculosis of the spine. There's a big V in their backs. Uh, the one on the left has a 120 degree angle. The one on the right has a 95 degree angle. Um, the natural history of this is that they are still growing and it's going to get worse and it can crush their lungs and also crush their spinal cord, um, which is terrible for many reasons. And so they could end up paralyzed and dying quite soon. So I wanted to help them. And I could not get anyone to operate on them. So they were sort of ticking time bombs in front of my eyes. And then I got this brilliant idea. I could adopt them, add them to my American health insurance, and get them surgery in the United States. Now, the problem is when you adopt an Ethiopian orphan who doesn't have any relatives, they become yours for life. So on one hand, I could save their lives. On the other hand, we'd have to spend the rest of our lives together. So did I want that much permanence in my life? I, I actually didn't know the answer to that, but I had this idea. So I was walking along one day and I looked up at the Almighty and I said, literally, I said, what do you want me to do? And a few days later, and I'm not like one who just gets, you know, messages from Hashem, unfortunately, but a few days later, he like sent me a fax to my brain and it became 100% clear. And the answer was this, I'm offering you a chance to help these boys. Don't say no. So I said, okay. So I adopted them, added them to my American health insurance. And like every single step is difficult, believe me. Brought them down to Dallas, Texas. And they ended up having surgery in Dallas. Next picture. Here they are after their surgeries. Semenyo on the left is now in pharmacy school in Atlanta. Dejeni on the right studied electrical engineering in Boston and is now a businessman in Addis. Next. This is a real picture. Um, I sent this picture to the spine surgeon with the caption, spinal stress test successful. If anyone wants to try this with your son, um, or your friend, I don't know. Uh, the person on my side has to weigh about 20 pounds more than the other one. Um, so they were my first two spine patients. Another spine patient came along and I adopted him and repeated the process. But serial adoption, it's probably not the answer to spine disease. So I needed to come up with a better solution. And I do have a better solution, and it has an unusual name. His name is Ohenaba Bawachiyaje, and you will see him in a few minutes, but let's go to the next picture. This is a boy named Ali Muhammad. Ali came to us at Mother Teresa's mission. Next. This is a big soft tissue tumor. This is called Burkitt's lymphoma. And I canceled my vacation because I, was the only one who knew how to treat this to the extent that anyone knows how to treat this. I came up with a recipe based on what we had, what we could find in the stores and I started treating him. He is a Muslim orphan, speaks the language called Oromo. His mouth was getting smaller and smaller and was gonna crush his mouth and suffocate him within weeks. Next picture. Here he is getting, that's his grandfather getting chemotherapy at Mother Teresa's mission. So if you have cancer in London and you're a kid, you have medical clowns to visit you and they give you iPads. At Mother Teresa's, you get a very comfortable bed and you get a bucket to vomit into and that's it. And he was perfectly happy. There he is, next. 
Every three weeks, I had to sit him up and give him an injection about an inch and a half into his spinal canal. Um, it's called intrathecal chemotherapy to keep the cancer from spreading. Next. And there he is when he finished. So $1,200 of Indian generic drugs. Um, and we, I was able to save his life. He went back to his village. He calls sometimes and he's doing fine. So for a while, I was doing a lot of all the cancer work at Mother Teresa's mission. Next. Okay, so I got a call from a Catholic nun that there was a Muslim boy who was mauled by a hyena. Um, next picture. We brought the kid and his dad to Mother Teresa's. There's the dad, there's the boy. I sat down to take a history. The dad told me this amazing story. He was in his mud hut, no electricity. He heard some noise. He looked out the door and he saw a hyena attacking his son. Now hyenas have like the strongest jaws in the world and he knew that if he tried to defend his son, his son, he himself could get eaten. And he said to himself, if this hyena is gonna kill my son, he's gonna kill me first. And so he starts fighting with the hyena, risking his own life. The hyena runs away and he thought the kid was dead. So he brings the kid to a Catholic hospital they nurse him back to health. They called me nine months later. They said, we have this small boy. He lost his scalp. He lost his eye. He lost his ear. And he lost the top of his jawbone, which is called the ramus of the mandible. And he needs extensive surgery. Do you have any ideas? Well, I had friends visiting from the Jewish community in Dallas, Texas that night. And over dinner, I said, you wouldn't believe this kid I got. He was mauled by a hyena. I don't know what to do. He needs so much surgery. My friend Ron Romaner said, Rick, I'm active in this organization called Friends of the Western Galilee Hospital. Send it to me. We'll send it on to Naharia and see if they're interested. I sent it on. The next day, the head of Naharia Hospital called me and he said, get me the kid. We want to operate. Next picture. So we go to, we get him a passport, we get him an Israeli visa. Now the Israeli ambassador to Ethiopia was herself Ethiopian. And so we were at the Israeli embassy. She phoned me on my cell phone saying, come on into my office when you finish. We went in, we sat down, we had tea with her speaking in Amharic. And then she said, um, hold on a minute. She left me where she is. And she went into her house. She came out five minutes later with two pairs of pants and two shirts. She said, I have a son the same age, same size. Here's some clothes for your son to wear while he's in Israel. So on the way out, this Muslim gentleman said, doctor, what kind of ambassador gives you clothes from her own kids? And I said, a Jewish mother. So uh, that was his introduction. Next picture. Here we are at the airport about to put them on the plane. I said to him, how do you feel? And he said, I'm nervous. And I said, why? And he said, we're afraid of Israel. And I said, what do you mean you're afraid of Israel? And he said, in my village, when we want to insult each other, we don't say go to hell. We say go to Israel because Israel and hell are the same thing to us. And I said, don't worry, man, you're in good hands. He went off to Israel spent nine weeks in and out of the hospital. Next. He had at one point, uh, they needed to immobilize him for nine days. So they made a new jawbone out of a piece of his rib by computer and then by in real. Um, he was immobilized. Um, the respirator was breathing for him. He was being fed through his veins. And the dad was told, your son is going to be asleep for nine days, and then we're going to wake him up, and he's going to be okay. Now, the dad knew this is impossible. It would be the equivalent of me saying to any of you folks on the call, I'm going to send you to Mars tomorrow morning, and you're going to be back in a week, and you're going to be fine. Like, you just know this cannot be done. The dad stayed in the room, except to go to the mosque, except to go to the bathroom. He was there, just looking at his son, convinced his son was dead. 
And when he tells the story, he says, and then after, di- after nine days, his soul returned to him. And the word for soul in Amharic is nefs. So he said, the nefs, yeah, the nefs returned to him and he woke up. And so this guy now thinks Israel is the most fantastic country in the world. He came back with more clothes than Imelda Marcos owns. And he was on Israel- Ethiopian television talking about the amazing care he got in Israel. Israel could not pay a million dollars for this publicity of this poor Muslim guy mauled by a hyena who got the most amazing care in Israel and then went on Ethiopian television to tell the whole country about it in great detail. So this, it turned out extremely well. Next. There he is. Next. Okay. Uh, it says in the Talmud, mitzvah goredit mitzvah. Now I'm going to tell you an amazing story. Next. Okay, this is a woman who doesn't, she happens to be Muslim. She doesn't normally wear a burqa, but I bought her her first burqa. And we're getting on a plane, or here we've just gotten off a plane in Minneapolis, and she's wearing the burqa. Why is a Jewish doctor buying a burqa for my patients? Next. Okay, some of you can read CAT scans, probably not the majority, but this is the brain sliced um, down the middle and the stuff on the, the white stuff, the white line going down is the spinal cord, the, the sort of gray matter, as you would say, on the upper right side of the brain is the brain and the round thing with different compartments on the left side of the brain, it's like the size of an orange. It looks a bit like an orange in the middle of the brain, but this is a soft tissue tumor. So that she had a brain tumor, which had been growing for 10 years and is squashing her brain. She lost her eyesight, she lost her sense of smell. And whether this is cancer or not doesn't matter because she's, it's gonna squash her brain and she's gonna die. Next. Okay, that's what this poor lady looks like, sorry. But you can see it's popping her eye out. Next. Okay, why is this lady alive? This lady is alive because I put on tefillin every day. How is that possible? Okay, I, I'm sure many of you put on tefillin every day. I put on tefillin this morning. I didn't save anyone's life. Um, but I was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I set my alarm, it didn't go off. I woke up at at 10 to eight and I had to be out at eight o'clock. So, you know, this happens to all of us sometimes. You throw on your clothes, you brush your teeth, you run out the building. And I put my tefillin in my backpack. After my first meeting, I said to the guy taking me around, you know, let me do shachar properly, take me to a synagogue. He took me to uh, Haredi Synagogue in St. Louis Park I walked in and I started putting on tefillin and I said hello to the guy sitting next to me. And he said, hello. So I said, I'm just talking to some guy in synagogue. And I said, what do you do here? And he said, oh, I'm a doctor. And I said, oh yeah, what kind of doctor? And he said, he had no idea who I was. And I said, he said, it's very specific. It's called skull-based neurosurgery. I'm a brain surgeon and I concentrate on the bottom of the brain. So I said, oh, that's interesting. I do tropical medicine in Africa. Let me show you something. So this is November in Minneapolis, which is really cold. I didn't want my computer to freeze. So I opened up my computer in the synagogue and I start showing him the scans of this patient. And he says, oh my gosh, I've never seen anything like this. After synagogue, after services, we stayed in touch. I sent him all the scans and he said, I really want to help this woman. Because of that meeting in synagogue, I brought her to Minneapolis six months later, a lot of planning, and she had a full day surgery by a skull-based neurosurgeon, a cranial facial surgeon, an oculoplastic surgeon. And next, here she is. So this is a Muslim orphan raised by Catholic nuns at Mother Teresa's mission, getting free surgery at St. Joseph's Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota, by Dr. Eric Nussbaum and his team. If you had said to me the day before, Rick, 
make sure you put on tefillin properly tomorrow because you're going to save the life of a Muslim woman. I would have said, no, that is absolutely impossible. But that's what happened. And my only intention was to, to do a proper shahri and it ended up saving the life of this patient. So if you ever have so, some- Hang on a second, Rick. So you, hang on, so you, have, you have a Muslim patient in a Catholic hospital being treated by Jewish doctors. Yes. Is that called tikkun olam or something? Something like that. <laughs> okay. So if you ever don't, don't know what's going on or you have some question in your life, go to synagogue, put on tefillin, say hello to the person next to you. You never know what it's going to lead to. Next. Okay, this is a guy named Tesfai. Next. Tesfai is a poor guy who was illiterate. He came in like that. Literally, his spine was horizontal on top. This is a combination of tuberculosis of the spine and ankylosing spondylitis. Next. It's really not compatible with life because it's crushing his lungs. That's his CAT scan. So that actually doesn't look like a human being. That looks like a reptile. Next. I wanted to help this guy, and it was before we had the capacity in Ghana. Well, I have a wonderful donor named Gary Siegel in Vancouver, British Columbia. Gary worked for a year, and he got TESFI accepted, and Gary helped fund this at Vancouver General Hospital. We flew TESFI over to Vancouver. Next. There is Dr. Marcel Dvorak, the best spine surgeon in Western Canada. There's Gary, there's TESFI. Next. Tesfai had a huge surgery. They rebuilt his back. Next. He lived in Vancouver at Gary's house for six months. There he is after his surgery. Next. And he just graduated from university in Addis Ababa and he's working on starting a business with Gary's help. So, um, Gary Siegel is an amazing guy and Gary changed my life and I changed Gary's life. And when I, when, I, when I give speeches about Gary in front of other people, I say, Gary doesn't just write checks. And then I say, and I love people who write checks. Gary opened up his home and he had set test by living in his house for six months. And he transformed his life. And then he's raised a huge amount of money to keep us going as well. Now I'm going to tell you a story about two brothers. Next. This guy walks into my office, these two boys. Okay, the guy on the right is a 32-year-old priest. And anyone in Ethiopia, this is like the typical guard of a priest. There's hundreds of thousands of these um, Ethiopian Orthodox priests. Ethiopian Orthodoxy is a fascinating religion. It's the religion in the world closest to Judea, the Christian religion in the world closest to Judaism. They have something of a Saturday Sabbath. All the men are circumcised. Um, they follow Jewish dietary laws. It, it's, they talk, they don't, they, when they bless each other, they bless by Yisrael Amlach, by the God of Israel. So we feel right at home. They actually don't, they don't realize that we don't believe in Jesus and they think that we are somehow part of them. So the guy on the right is a typical Orthodox priest. His younger brother, who's in his early 20s, was handicapped with a bad back. And somebody said, there's a doctor in Addis Ababa who can help you. And his name is Rick. And he works in the basement of a busy city hospital. Find your way there. So the, the brother says to his wife, we don't have $20 to buy a bus ticket to Addis Ababa. We're going to sell a cow so that we have money to go. The wife said, no, you don't. You are not selling our cow. This is like selling your car, okay? You're gonna, uh, you cannot sell your cow. So um, find a different way. So they said, okay, we'll walk. So here they are. They walk into my office and I look down at their feet next. And I said, gee, your shoes are in bad shape. And they said, we walked here. And I said, the bus station is eight miles away. They said, no, 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 we walk from Gojam. That's 250 miles. So then I said, 250 miles? 
where did you sleep at night? Because we all know there's hyenas in the countryside. You don't sleep out in the open. And he answered me with this phrase that we understand. It's hardly ever been written about, but they call it Xavier Engida. Xavier Engida means guest of God. And he just said, Xavier Engida, guest of God. But what that signifies is a whole hospitality system. And so in the Ethiopian countryside, you knock on any door in a Christian village and you say, Xavier Engida, I'm a guest sent to you by God. And they will automatically be honored, open up their house, invite you in, cook you dinner the way you'd cook for a guest, give you a place to sleep, and it may be on their dirt floor, give you a basin of water and soap to wash your feet, and then show you out in the morning. They did this eight nights in a row. Nobody said no. And the Muslims have the same system. They call it Allah Engida, guest of Allah. So it's, you know, people think, oh, this is Africa, people are primitive. Look at this amazing kindness. This is Abraham, this is out of, this is out of the Tanakh. So they walk into my office, next. And here's the guy, next. That's his back, next. There he is. Next. You can see what his spine looks like. Next. Okay, stop right there. So we sent him off to Ghana. He, and I'll talk about this. He went into traction. He had traction. He had surgery. He came back. Um, he finished. He was a design student. He finished his design course. He's living in my house in Addis Ababa. And I'm living in Tennessee, but I spoke to him the other day and I said, what are you doing? And he said, I opened up a factory. And I said, what do you mean? So one of my, one of my donors gave me money and we bought him a sewing machine. He's turned my living room into a mask factory and he's making masks and he's selling the masks for, it costs him a few cents to make a mask. He sells them for a dollar each. And he said to me, the only reason I'm alive and doing well is because of you. You get half of the money that I make from masks. So this guy who would have caught pneumonia and died because of his compressed lungs is now an entrepreneur living in my house, making masks to go fund surgeries for other patients. Next. Okay, I'll just read a bit of this. I am Naritu Mukhtar, the mother of Sulam Tumaga. I've been informed in detail about the difficulties of Salam's condition. I've been informed of the high probability of paralysis without surgery and with surgery. I've spoken with Salam and I now decided that I agree with her wishes for spine surgery by Dr. Bwachi and his team. Next. So we needed a second permission because this woman was in, this girl was in such bad shape. We called her mom. She spoke to her daughter for a half hour. She can't, she's illiterate. So she's signing with her thumb. Next. And you can just, you can feel her heart. Just look at that angst. Look at the, the worries of a mom here who's praying to God that her daughter doesn't become paralyzed or die. Next. There's the girl, next. There she is, next. That's her spine, next. Okay, so though, for those of you who can, who can read x-rays, that circle there is you're looking into the spinal canal because the spine is horizontal, next. And that's a close-up of this terrible area. So she went into traction, which she was still nearly paralyzed, next. She had some paralysis after surgery. She learned to walk again. She came back to Ethiopia using a walker, but she walked out of the airport too proud to use a walker because um, she wanted to show her mom that she's walking on her own. Next. And look at this beautiful girl. So we saved her life. We completely turned her life around. This would be a half a million dollar surgery in America. And in Ghana, we do this for $25,000. Next. Uh, just uh, just tell us about your, your Ghana connection over there, because I know uh, it's a very important one. Okay. 
It's coming up. Okay, so what do we do in Ghana? Next. I met a guy named Ohenabobwachiaje, who's the best, in my opinion, uh, the best spine surgeon in the world. He left Ghana when he was 18. He went to Brooklyn College, Columbia University Medical School, um, trained in orthopedics in New York City, spines in uh, Minnesota, and he helped invent and many, many new spine te surgery techniques. So we're in Ghana, we're drilling four holes in the skull at a place called Focus, F-O-C-O-S Hospital. Um, here you can see a kid, four screws against the skull. Next. And this is a world's record picture because there's nobody else in the world except Dr. Boachi and I, who were doing this on a mass, mass scale. In Manhattan, right now, there is probably one patient in all of New York City in traction. And when we send a group, we end up with 20 kids in traction. So there's a spring system, there's a pressure gauge. You put them, you start off with five pounds of pressure and you're pulling them up. Um, and then they go up to about half their body weight over a three week period. And we leave them that way for several months we hope to get about a 50% correction. And then Dr. Bwachi and his team goes ahead and they operates. Now, what do we do as human beings all day long? We sit, we stand, or we lie down. So they're here you see these girls are sitting, but they're being pulled up by the pulley system. Next. And in Ghana, when it's cooler, they stand and they're being they're walking around and they're being stretched. You can see there's a movable booth around them with wheels and we have this, the spring system and the pressure gauge. The girl in the purple shirt is one of our staff. She herself was a spine patient. She graduated and she went back to Ghana as a staff to help other kids. Next. And that's my waiting list. I just lined up everybody in clinic one day and <laughs> took a picture. Next. So this is my surgical partner, my uh, somehow older brother. His name is Ohana Babuachi Ajay. Absolutely wonderful guy. He's a very religious Baptist in Ghana. We were seeing patients all day long at a Christian hospital in Addis Ababa. At the end of the day, I said, let's take a picture. And he, you know, seeing Jesus, he said, Rick, let's put Jesus in the picture. So we stood in front of Jesus and I said to him, two Jews and a Christian. <laughs> and he burst out laughing and then we took the picture. Next. And that's our kids. The kid with the Jordan 23 is an orphan who uh, got successfully got surgery and now I'm his legal guardian. The one on the far right with the, with, in the wheelchair, uh, he came to us completely paralyzed. We sent him and his mom to Ghana and uh, he had a spinal cord tumor removed. Now he's walking and he's okay. Um, and this is what we're doing. We're turning the lives around of these people. And, and Rick, Rick you, you, you've um, adopted five, five yeah, uh, uh, people, young people. The that's oldest true. being being how old now? Now he's in his 30s. He's the one who's in uh, pharmacy school. Right. Okay. And, and the others are still living with you in his 20s. He graduated from university last year, and he's now doing marketing for Yelp and living the life of a, a Jewish hipster in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And the others? The other ones are doing different things. One's a teacher, one's a businessman, one is working for working on government contracts. So yeah, they all have their own lives. And t tell us about Mar Marilyn Berger's uh, adopted child. Oh, so Marilyn Berger is the wife of Don Hewitt, the widow of Don Hewitt, the producer of 60 Minutes. Marilyn came out to Ethiopia to write an article about me for Reader's Digest. Um, and while she and her assistant, her assistant was Chloe Mall, the daughter of Candace Bergen and Louis Mall. Uh, while they were walking to Mother Teresa's mission to see me, they met a kid begging in the street who had tuberculosis of the spine. So we tracked down this kid and we treated him for TB of the spine and got him surgery in Ghana. Fast forward, he was adopted 
adopted by Maryland. Um, and he's now living in, in New York. And uh, he should have graduated from high school about a week ago. So I need to call Maryland, and make sure that, you know, he was uh, also like out of school because of lockdown and so on. But he's doing okay. Thank you for asking. So Marilyn tells a story in her book, This is a Soul, uh, the book that she wrote about you. And she tells the story that when she comes to your, she comes to this crowded, this crowded room, uh, and apparently you don't have a booking system. It's not as if there's some sophisticated NHS arrangement where people book, you know, online, etc. They just kind of turn up and sit over there and you, you see everybody every day. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah, I want to see everybody on the day they come, at least for a moment. Okay. So apparently uh, she says that um, she watches you at work uh, and uh, you take a photograph um, because obviously you want to be able to see, you know, the condition and you might want to have um, some x-rays taken or CT scan or whatever. But she's a bit puzzled why you take a photograph of their uh, of their faces and then you send, when you send the photographs across to your network of colleagues around the world, you send them the person's face. And the, some of these people ask you, well, why, why do we need to see that? I mean, you just send us the photographs that we need to see, show us that, you know, the problem. So just talk us through why you take a photograph always of the person's face. So that's a very interesting question because even if I'm sending a chest X-ray, if I have a question about a chest X-ray and I'm sending it to an, a radiologist in America, I will also send a picture of the patient you know, and these are radiologists who read x-rays all day long. They don't get to see what patients look like. But somebody said, why do you do that? And I said, this is a human being. This is a soul. This is not just an x-ray. This is not just bones and lungs. And I want them to see that this is a, a person with a face like the rest of us. And there's even a study from Israel where when radiologists got a photograph of the patient along with the x-ray, the quality of reading the x-ray, the accuracy of their diagnoses increased. So it's nice to put a human face on it and not just say, you know, this is an x-ray. And that's why she writes, uh, she calls her book, This is a Soul. Yeah. Because that's the essence of what you're doing, isn't it, Rick? I you're hope. not dealing with medical problems, you're dealing with human beings and giving them a life. I try. Yeah. So um, what's your structure and network? I, I know that, you know, I'm a bit puzzled because the Joint Distribution Committee, as far as I had always understood, was an organization that uh, sort of gives out a lot of money to, you know, to help people. And I know that um, they don't give you any money. You've got to go and raise it all yourself, all $2 million of it a year. Um, it sounds like um, they learn something from Chabad. You know, they do the same sort of thing. They throw a guy out into some forgotten part of the world and say, go and raise your own money. So uh, what's, what's your structure, what's your setup, or what's your networking over here? How does it all work? So we're sort of a branch of JDC, but we are self-sustaining. Um, so we get infrastructure from JDC, but we don't, uh, we don't get a lot of money and we work to raise our own funds and keep going to help our patients. And my donors how much, are- How much of your, of your precious time, your precious time that you could spend in front of patients is spent traipsing around the world trying to raise money? Um, 25%. Well, I mean, now I'm in the States, so I don't have time. I'm not seeing patients, so I have more time. But in Ethiopia, maybe 20%. But I make trips to the States all the time, and I speak to groups. And, um, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity to, now that we're all getting used to Zooming and things like that, I don't have to physically show up in London um, to present what we do and to try to get people interested. Yeah. Let me talk to you I, I do, like, sometimes I speak to medical groups and just giving a pure medical talk. Yeah. Uh, Nicola Rosenfelder, who introduced you to us, and thank you so much for that, Nicola, um, and for this very you know, inspirational, inspirational opportunity to hear from you. Um, and here's Nicola and her, Mike and the family, um, ah. told me that uh, you kind of like self-taught yourself around the oncology business, and she describes how on an occasion when she visited, there were you had a couple of your patients sitting on your veranda with some kind of mocked up chemotherapy arrangement that you had set up for them in the absence of any kind of real drugs or, or facilities, etc. Uh, how, how does all of that work, Rick? So when I started out, you know, there's, there's a lot of bone cancer in Ethiopia. 
And the data on bone cancer is something like if you only amputate the knee, which is, you know, you answer, amputate above the knee, um, then survival is going to be about one third. But you can increase it to about 60% um, if you give amputate and you give chemotherapy. So I needed to give chemotherapy. When I started out this, there was no place to give chemotherapy. So I moved two patients, two boys into my house to give them chemotherapy. I put a, a bed on my front porch. They, there was one bed, so their, their heads were on opposite sides and their feet were overlapping. And I had the cisplatin doxorubicin hanging from my drain pipe with dental floss. Um, and I had, you know, I used completely sterile technique and was giving IV fluid and giving them their chemotherapy. And, um, and so aluminum foil. Uh, yeah, exactly. You need to use aluminum foil because uh, one of them, the, the doxorubicin is sensitive to the light. So you need to cover it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. yeah. And so what percentage of your patients are you dealing for? What are you doing in, in relation to cancer these days? You've got this amazing arrangement with Ghana in terms of spine and spines uh, and occasionally to, to America as well. Uh, what about your oncology patients? Where do they go? So um, a friend of mine, one of the two boys, um, the two boys, did, one of them is still, Muhammad, named Mohammed is still alive. The other one had a recurrence and I was able to send him to Washington DC to a friend and she, he had further chemotherapy and he lived for several years. That friend that I sent him to, who welcomed him into her house for several years until he died, um, funded a project to, tr to train pediatric oncologists in Ethiopia. Her name is Mary Louise Cohen, by the way. Um, and so when I have cancer patients, I don't have to treat them myself anymore. I send them to Mary Lou Cohen's project, um, Mary Louise Cohen's project. Uh, and what, what are you seeing in relation to the third, uh, the third area of your activity? Because your um, formal, um, uh, your formal uh, title is um, Ethiopia's Spine and Heart Project. So talk to us right, a little bit so, about so what you're seeing in relation to heart disease and how you're dealing with it. So in Ethiopia, um, we have a lot of, now there's a rise in heart attacks, but there's still a lot of rheumatic fever from uh, strep infections and congenital heart disease, like holes in the heart and tetralogy of fallow, which is untreated. And so I wanted to help them. And so we were raising money and we sent our pay. I, I, at one point, somebody gave me a small grant. I went off to India and I went, heart hospital shopping and I found a wonderful Hindu hospital in Cochin and so we send our patients to a Hindu hospital and they get surgery there. Uh, the cost of replacing a mitral valve is about six thousand dollars. The cost of a balloon ballooning open uh, a mitral valve is about sixteen hundred dollars. Um, this is less than far less than ten percent of what it would be in the United States. And so when we have money for hearts, we send our patients to India for that. It, it so happens that we have a cardiologist from South Africa who's watching the program this evening that I know of. Uh, and you might want to um, make a connection with South Africa because it's a lot closer than the United States sure. of America. So we're slightly related, by the way. He happens to be my wife and my son. Oh, wow. <laughs> so there is a connection there to be, to be explored for your, for your heart patients because South Africa is pretty sophisticated in its, uh, yeah. its problems. Yeah. Well, okay. This has been, you know, a really fascinating and, and wonderful, um, wonderful uh, interview. Um, I want to to bring it to a close by referring to um, something that um, I found really very, very inspirational indeed, and I want to take you back to. 1994 in, in Goma, Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, this was, uh, there was, you visited a refugee camp where there was an outbreak of cholera, uh, and this was a result of the, from the Rwandans who were fleeing, fleeing genocide. Uh, and you knew that people were dying left, right, and center. As a matter of fact, even to get to the camp, you had to go on the back of a truck that was, um, used for carrying dead dead bodies 
Uh, and before le leaving Adas for Goma, you had this big question about who to treat and who to let go, because clearly you couldn't, you know, there had to be some, some form of, of, of uh, priority in um, you know, who you treat first. So you asked a Sha'ela, you asked a question to a, a rabbi who you knew in Los Angeles, who in turn referred to the question to a specialist rabbi in Philadelphia. And shortly before you were about to set off for Goma, you received a fax with the rabbi's answer. Uh, and I wonder if you can just share with us um, what answer you received about how to prioritize life. So my quite, you know, I worked with cholera as a medical student in Bangladesh. And I know in cholera epidemics, which is a massive watery diarrhea, you have a lot more patients than you can handle. So my question was, who do I treat first? Who do I treat second? Should I ignore people who are 70 years old because they've lived most of their lives? And should I give priority to the mom? Should I give priority to the kids? I didn't know what to do. Um, and I thought, well, let me see what a rabbi has to say. So I asked, um, and they sent me back this answer. And the bottom line was, I should not decide who to treat first and who to treat second. I should treat whoever comes to me in the order they come to me in, or whoever I see in the order they, that we come, who comes to me. So my team and I would fill up with water and IV fluid, and we'd go out into the camps, and we'd be like 100 feet away from each other. And we just go step by step by step, plugging in IVs. Um, I do something called peritoneal hydration and giving oral rehydration and trying to rehydrate these patients one by one in the order that they came to us. And that worked as well as anything. So the rabbi said, um, all life is precious. Treat them in the order in which they come to you. Yeah. All life and is the other, precious. The other interesting thing he said was, once you've started treating somebody, don't stop. Like, don't say you have 20 minutes and then I'm leaving you and going on to somebody else. Like, once you've taken the, the responsibility of starting, stay with them. So I suppose in a sense, Rick, this is uh, the story of your life, you know, and the, the people that you treat, these beggars who come off the streets, the people who have no money, you treat them for free, nobody's ever charged, you raise the money, I know that secretly. Hey, just before we go on, tell us about the eggs, the boiled eggs. <laughs> you know about that. Um, so we, I boil eggs um, and I bring them to clinic because some patients are going to be hungry. Um, but I don't want them to feel like I'm giving them charity. So I say to them, will you do me a favor? I have so many chickens in my house. I wake up in the morning and there's eggs everywhere. Take some of these off my hands. Like we're swimming in eggs, take 10 eggs. And like for them, it's such a treat to get 10 eggs. Um, and then I had one guy who was a very malnourished boy with tuberculosis. And he was at Mother Teresa's mission. And I told him he has to eat five eggs a day. Um, and I said, we have this idea, if, if a chicken is big, we call it a farange chicken, which means a white, a white person's chicken. Um, and I said, I'm gonna order you eggs from my farange chicken. And so the next day when I brought him eggs, it had his name on it in English. And I said, our American chickens, my chickens come from America and they speak English and they can, when you order it, it comes out with your name on it. And, they, <laughs> and my Ethiopian chickens, it comes out with your name in Amharic. And so we gave him smaller eggs from the Ethiopian chickens and bigger eggs from the American chickens um, with his name on it. And we said, this, this is laid just for you. <laughs> and just while I just remember it, just tell us the, the story about this young man who um, was offered um, either amputation because of cancer uh, or this, this person had this extraordinarily distorted body with his knees pointing backwards and the most terrible, terrible physical disability. And he would have to undergo a, a, a mess of, of painful operations one after the other. And this is very recent. This happened just before coronavirus struck. Just very quickly, um, before we finish this evening, tell us this inspiring story of, of a young man's courage. 
So this is a guy named Andebet. This is on my website. This is public information. He walked into my office maybe about a year ago now. Um, he, he had heard that there were, he has knees that go out at 45 degree angles. He has 13 fingers. He has 12 toes. Um, he's very, he has some genetic situation called Ellis Van Crevel. Um, and he needed extensive surgery. And I found one place that would be a fantastic place that could do it and do it for free. So I know one of the junior doctors there and I approached him and I said, um, what are my chances of getting my patient accepted? And he said, the problem is they end up with, they have holes in their hearts and they have extra kidneys and things like that. And we end up with all these other problems that we have to deal with. So we don't like that. So I said, okay, uh, when I did the workup, I made sure he had no other problems. I made the application. They accepted him. He and I flew in February from Addis Ababa. This is a guy who had never been out of his village. We got him a passport. We flew together to New York. We spent a few days in New York, and then we went on to Dallas, Texas, found a wonderful Ethiopian host family. He's now in the hospital. They offered him two choices. One is to amputate at the knee and get a good prosthesis. It's the Zoom from the shul about this amazing doctor. <laughs> so you need to in... Charles, Charles. Hang on. Um, I'm hang a second. Rick, you need to unmute now because we were all muted. We didn't even know that Charles ever had a microphone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's we speak on Zoom. Welcome. Okay. Carry on now. So it turns out... Um, he had a choice between amputating at the knee and getting a good prosthesis or undergoing two years of painful surgeries to realign his legs because his kneecaps are on the side and you need to move them obviously to the front of the knees. And he said, no, I want my own body. And he opted for, for surgery. And so he had the first of the surgery um, about two weeks ago and it was on a Thursday. During the operation, the governor made the announcement no elective surgeries um, until coronavirus is finished. They had already started his surgery so they could finish it. And so he's now in the process of getting, and he can, he can now it's not elective anymore because he needs to have further surgeries. So they, were, they did the first surgery exactly the last day. Um, and he ended up being, uh, he's, on, he's on the process to get well. He was in a lot of pain for a while. Now he's in less pain, so he's doing okay. This is a very uh, courageous boy, very that courageous. Is, that, is, that is real courage. Okay, so just, just come back to this where we, where we interrupted. I, I wanted to suggest that, um, that all life is precious could really be the motto, the motto under which you work. It could be the, almost sort of your strap line, all life is precious, because you just take all of these people, some of them waifs and strays without parents, um, some of them have walked for days and days and days to get to you. Every life is precious. And you, it seems that you take um, each person just for who they are and make no value judgments about them in relation to race or color. Is, is this part, Rick, of um, an expression of your, of your Jewishness, of your, of your faith? In, in, in what way does this great discovery of your Jewish purpose in life impact upon the way in which you see your work and your life's, your life's work now? Um, you know, I'm, I'm an observant Jew, and so Judaism is sort of everything to me. I mean, like, you know, I, I live by the Jewish calendar, as we do, and um, I put on tefillin every day, and I do Shabbat, and these people know that they're being helped by a Jewish doctor and by Jewish donors. And um, it, you know, it, it gives me purpose in my life. And I just, I, I, I love it. Are you lonely? No, I'm tired. I'm not lonely. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously work very long days. What time do you start? What time do you end? Now in Ethiopia, these days, what I, in Ethiopia, normally I work at home in the morning and then I see patients in the, in the afternoon. And that's a very nice schedule because I wake up when I want to wake up. I work for a few hours, then I go to the gym and then I spend the afternoon in clinic. So if I'm lucky, I'll get out at five. Um, sometimes we're in clinic till eight o'clock at night. It just depends. Right. 
So um, I, we've, my wife and I, Lindy and I, have never had the, the privilege in the, of spending a Friday night in your home. Um, but I think um, if we were to do so, I think we'd very much enjoy the song which is, uh, which is sung there, as I understand, on Friday nights. Um, when you have everybody around the table wearing funny old hats, which are passed around to everybody, so that all this motley group of guests, some of them Americans, some of them students, some of them uh, your, uh, your, the people who, the waifs and strays are all uh, bedding down with you and somehow living in this great big house all together with you. And everybody sits around a Shabbat table uh, and they wear their funny hats uh, and then they sing Pete Seeger's song, If I Had a Hammer, uh, and everybody sings together I'd sing out love between my brothers and sisters all over this land. Uh, is that still sung every Friday night, Rick? Every Friday night, yeah. We started that, there's a, there's a book called The Family Participation Haggadah, and I was planning Pesach, and we did it during Pesach, and then we just liked it so much, we decided to make it our song, and we do it every Friday night. We do and Shalom that, Aleichem after that, but we, and that's we start off your teeth, then. I'd sing out love between my brothers and sisters all over the land, and that's indeed right. what you do with your life. Right. Rick, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know there have been people who have wanted to ask questions, but we've gone well over time because it's just been so very, very fascinating. Uh, can I say to all of our all of our participants and viewers tonight, this is not a fundraiser, and it was never intended as a fundraiser. But you've heard about the incredible work that uh, that Rick does, and that he has to fund it himself. If there's any any of you who uh, have an interest in supporting Rick in, in his work, and he's not asked me to say this, I'm saying this of my own volition. But if there's anybody who would be interested in supporting this, or know people who would be interested in supporting this. It seems that you're supported in the main by Jewish philanthropists around the world, Rick. Uh, you just need to contact either Nicola or me and we'll put you in touch uh, with, with Rick and his, and his organizations. But in the meantime, Rick, thank you so much for spending your special, precious time with us. So we wish you good, good fortune and continue to save lives in this very, very special way. Thank you very much. And as we say in Tennessee, sei <laughs>